we started looking at uh, sentences which is syntax and we will continue looking at some of the components of a sentence we have addressed some of the questions like what is a sentence made of what's what's important part in a sentence and uh, how do we how do we make one right uh, we have tried to answer those questions in in some sense but here are some more questions that are going to be interesting for us to understand such as what's a subject in a sentence we have we have talked about this thing briefly what's a subject if someone asks you now what's a subject what will be the answer loudly sentence minus predicate but that's nice uh, mathematical theorem but uh, doesn't help much understanding uh, a subject the the idea of a subject that that's all all right that's okay which which in a way tells us this this proposition that subject is different from predicate subject is not part of the predicate therefore it has a different status compared to every other element which are part of predicate is is something is one thing about a, about a subject in other words predicate contains objects and verbs okay and other elements so if we are talking about three elements like subject verb and object we know with this uh with this description that subject is different from verb and predicate it has a different status right so uh how do we define it how do we define it in a more precise way the word which is in agreement with the verb is that sounds better a noun or a word more precisely we can say a noun uh we are going to call it something else which is a noun phrase little later once we talk about phrases so we can say a word or a noun that agrees with the verb and we have already seen what agreement means so but in the sentence sima ne said ha ha and this will take sima as sentence so no that is a semantic subject that's a so semantic subject is, right so here we are talking about the grammatical no we are talking about both we are talking about both and the way to put both together of course save is in agreement with so the reason why i gave you the sentence seema ne sev khaye aur raju ne chai banayi one of the reason why one of the reasons why i wanted you to take a look at that that sentence is when we talk about subjects many a times we we do not look at uh, two parts of subjects one is semantic content of a subject and the other is grammatical component of a subject by now you have seen independence of syntax right by now you have seen a sentence which is the all that you need to make a sentence is its grammatical component even if a sentence doesn't make much sense like colorless green ideas sleep furiously a dog was reading a newspaper in the library in the night right these thing these sentences don't mean any sense they don't make any sense still they are grammatical sentences the fact that syntax is independent of meaning okay makes us think little bit harder at a point that there are two parts of subjects one is its semantic content so a word which is semantically a subject is called a logical subject okay so in a sentence like raju ne chai banayi raju is a still a logical subject but grammatically speaking the subject is the noun that agrees with the verb which happens to be chai in this sentence if you put all these things together you can say you can see that 
in many languages of the world, many a times, the other 99 percent of times or maybe little less or little more, both logical subject and grammatical subject are in one word. Therefore, we do not need to separate them to see two parts. However, in some cases you can categorically see logical subject is something else and grammatical subject is something else. What will be the predicate in this sentence? The you tell me. The 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 predicate will be. I mean that's 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 a great question. What will be a predicate? What your question is, is logical subject part of the predicate or not? Yes. Or if chai is if 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 we leave logical subject out, is the grammatical subject part of the predicate? That is that's the, that is what your question is into that. And we have seen that subjects are out of out of a predicate, right. So, it is that is a conceptual question in, in order to answer this question we need to look at some other some other stuff, ok. The, the reason why I am not giving you ans a straight answer to this question that this is the noun which is out of the out of the predicate and the other one is inside the predicate, there, there is a reason for that. The reason is the whole notion of subject is a conceptual notion. Still there is no going back on the point that subjects are outside the predicate. Subjects have higher status than components of predicate. That at a conceptual level still holds ok and that is part of principle. Also, what is part of principle is there must be a subject in a sentence. That is, without a subject, we do not have a sentence. Okay. Therefore, we see sentences like uh, go home. Is there, a sub, is there a subject here? Is there a subject here? No. Then, how does it follow the principle? We, we, ha we have I thought we did, but let me repeat it again. Principle of language says that there cannot be a sentence without a subject. And you understand the meaning of principle? The meaning of principle is this cannot be violated. Every sentence of every language must follow that. So, I am telling you it is such a strong rule that cannot be violated. That is every language and in every language every sentence must have a subject. And then I am giving you counter example also. We have a sentence in English go home. If this is a grammatical sentence, is this a grammatical sentence? And this is the meaning of grammaticality. If it is a grammatical sentence then it must be following principles of language. In other words, it must have a subject. So, what is the subject of this sentence? You. Why are we not saying you then? Implied, right? We, we understand that it is automatically implied. In all the languages of the world, when it comes to imperative sentences like these, go home, we do not need the subject overtly present. In other words, we do not need the physical presence of the word which, which becomes the subject. Can anybody guess or does anyone know why? This guess is not a big guess, you can still say. No, body language, think little harder. What I am saying is, this is the point where I can really extract some serious thinking from you. Why do we, why do we not think about Hindi? How do we say that in Hindi? Go home. Is there a subject here? No. That is overtly there is no subject. How do we say that in Tamil? Is there a subject there? No. Malayalam? 
how do we say loudly is there a subject there no if you know any other language just just try it there there is no subject that is when i say no subject no overt presence of a subject but you would agree that in all the languages english hindi tamil malayalam that we have seen right now in all of them the employed subject is you is that true the answer to this question is principle of economy if it is you everywhere then what's the point of saying that when we say go home right we mean if if i am talking to him and i am telling him go home i don't mean you go home right this is why the the subject of an imperative sentence is going to be second person and if the second person is the subject employed in every language there is no the languages do not feel the need to express it overtly and they tend to suppress it the lexical suppression that is not, not keeping subject overtly present in the language doesn't mean deleting the place of subject we can still retrieve the subject as you as long as we retrieve it dropping is not at all a problem now keep that in mind dropping doesn't mean no presence conceptually it is present so when we say no sentence without a subject we are talking about conceptual presence of subject we are not talking about in a written sentence subject must be there this is this point clear right now look at it look, look at it once again uh, uh, before i go to uh, predicate and talk little bit about that let me tell you one more point about this about subjects in a language like hindi tamil malayalam we can drop subjects in other places too suppose i want to say uh, i am eating an ice cream okay i am eating an ice cream how do i say that in hindi can i also say ice cream kha raha hu if someone asks me this question in the question also one doesn't need to give the subject what are you eating how do we say that what are you eating is not tum is not needed we can say kya kha rahe ho and the answer could be ice cream kha raha hu is this making sense to everybody now tamil do i need to say yes e, say i and in the question what are you eating do i need to say you that is aap aur tum how about malayalam so loudly loudly so do i need you in the question no in the answer do i need i see this thing to to talk about principles or parametric variations i i don't need to know the language that's one the other thing is the fact that there is no subject in these sentences right kya kha rahe ho or uh, ice cream kha raha hu doesn't mean these sentences do not have subjects when i say ice cream kha raha hu right it clearly means what mai right when i am asking kya kha rahe ho it clearly means only one thing which is tum get it if these things are retrievable if we can retrieve these things from the sentence then there is no need to put it or we can we can present the same thing in the following way as long as things are retrievable the language is allowed to drop them again it's part of principle of economy 
which means the universal principle which is subject must be in a sentence and principle of economy that as long as they are retrievable there is no need to keep them overtly present. There is no tension between these two rules. Get this? Get this point? And in the places where we see absence of subject does not really again contradict the principle of language that is no, th th there are sentences which do not have subjects. So, languages must follow universal principle and to whatever extent possible they must obey principle of economy. At the same time, each one of them definitely respects language internal rules. Right? Now, take the same example in English. If I want to ask you what are you eating, can I say are you eating? What are eating? Can I say that? No. This results into ungrammaticality because of the absence of you. Again, just because you is not retrievable from the context, the overt presence of you is required in English, which enforces us, which, which is language internal rule that a subject must be present in English overtly. Okay? English follows this rule verbatim. Our languages allows dropping categorically, D that is dropping of subjects categorically, clearly, vividly. See this thing? Uh, the, all we need to understand from this is there is no tension in tension between language internal rules, universal principle and following principle of economy. Clear? Okay. Uh, so, the, the I, I started this thing with your question, uh, which part of that is predicate? We, well, I, I want to keep, I, I have talked about many things and I think I have clarified some parts of it, but I want to keep rest of it for further level. When we talk about the actual conceptual structure of sentence, that, right? then you will see the subject is projected way high in the conceptual structure. Okay? Please remind me at that time, I will I'll, I'll remember to show it to you. Uh, very soon in a couple of days, I am going to come to conceptual structure. In the conceptual structure, subject is way high, which is just to capture the idea that subject is outside the predicate. Right? Given the introductory nature of your class, probably we will not go into too much of details, but keeping this question in mind, I will definitely show you that in that conceptual framework, there are different proposals where one proposal is no, 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 subjects are still part of predicate. What happens actually, it is just one of the proposals. What happens actually is once the sentences are projected outside, subjects move to the front, to the higher level. Actually, they are part of predicate. The people who, who propose such, who propose such a position, they have these things in mind. That how, can, how can we outrightly, outrightly postulate a subject which is way too high and outside the predicate? These are the problems. Understand my question? So, they become the basis of postulating subjects and everything within predicate. Now, if we just keep talking about these things in abstraction that subjects are also part of predicate, in, in some cases subjects may not be part of predicate, in some theoretical framework subjects are outside, in th some theoretical framework subjects are inside, they will not make sense. They will make sense when we have discussed that. Therefore, I am leaving, leaving this thing. But keep in mind, conceptually, there is a difference between the position of subject and position of everything else in predicate. Clear? 
all right <sighs> any any other question Does all the languages of the world have a concept of predicate? Yes. We just like we cannot have a sentence without a subject, we cannot have a sentence without a predicate, which simply means what is the part of what, what are the essential parts of predicate? There are certain parts of predicate that are essential, okay? out of which one which is extremely essential is a verb. Okay? Verb. Therefore, you do not have a sentence without a verb also. Okay? So, since every language of the world has a sentence, so what follows from there is there must be predicate in every language of the world. Clear? Okay. Uh, does the fact that English is verb final and most… Uh, English is verb medial. No, that does not have. See, why some languages are verb medial and why some languages are verb final are parametric. What, what your question is dropping of is, is, the dro is the whole phenomena of dropping of subject dependent on verb being final? No. What it is dependent on is rich morphology that is rich projections, rich agreement features. Now, what, what I mean by rich features is when you say tum kaha ja rahe ho, right? Look at the, look at the last verb part. Just the verb part. Okay. How do we how do we put the whole thing in English? Uh, going. going. Yes. Which happens to be just one word. Right? So at this level I can tell you by looking at it you can see this is richer than this. Still it is not very clear. Wh what we actually mean is the ing marker okay which is actually progressive or continuous aspect marker see this thing is actually a separate word in a language like hindi see this thing this is go this is ing now, what is this? This is in a way tense marker, right? This tells us about present tense, okay? Besides this telling you about tense marking, this, this talks about something else also, which is the presence of this. is correlated with the presence of this pronoun. Equivalent to you in a language like Hindi and I am sure it this distinction exists in other languages too, we have several things. Heard this thing? Am I right? And then there is something else which is not that much in use, but it still exists. Okay? Now, this pronoun which is still equivalent to you is not here if you have this as the marker. Right? Suppose I want to say up here, is the sentence good? Yes? No. In, in some form of the Hindi, some people can say, yes, it is good. Okay? Some people could speak this way. 
yes it is good but not really warranted why it is good please ask me this question why for some people it is good i'll talk to you about this little later we haven't reached that point what's the marker for up the 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 final marker if i want to keep up here what should i have here he see this thing the fact that this should this should be he at least tells you that this is the marker for something else if i want to say this one two what's the marker here tu ja raha hai can i say tu ja rahe hain no can i say tu ja rahe ho no see this thing what what i am trying to tell you is besides marking tense this also helps you retrieve the pronoun okay this is the meaning of rich projections rich morphology therefore it's possible to drop these things because i can i can retrieve this thing on the basis of this right the marker helps me retrieve the subject therefore we can drop not the final or medial position of verb clear okay uh, since since we mentioned can you give me a moment i'll quickly finish finish the question that came up that in some variety of hindi aap ja rahe ho could be acceptable the reason for that is very simple see this is in the hierarchy this is high this is mid and this is low okay in the hierarchy of formality so there is a reason why we have three variants right so what what we can do is and for for all of them there are different markers am i right there are different markers so what happens actually and again when i show you the conceptual tree that is conceptual representation of a sentence some of these things will become clearer what happens is a pronoun that is higher in the hierarchy can agree with something that is lower right but something that is lower on the hierarchy cannot agree with what is higher therefore you never see say tum ja rahe hain but aap ja rahe ho is possibly allowed in some variety of hindi is making sense so far we are still talking about subjects and its agreement features and i think the answer to your question should be clear now that the verb final is final status of the verb has very little to do with this do with why hindi and some other languages of south asian subcontinent allow dropping of subjects rich morphology rich projection is responsible for that okay all right now so to answer the question how do we define a subject we cannot have just one sentence definition we will have to talk about lot of things at least that is at least this should be clear to you from uh, clear to you so far what's the predicate in a sentence a predicate in a sentence as as you have seen minus subject everything else is a predicate is, is else everything else is predicate which means verbs are part of predicate and what's also clear from examples like these is 
all the markers that you see, whether it is a question of tense marker or a special markers for specific pronouns, uh, aspect marker, all of them and why and how verbs control agreement, all such information is inbuilt, encoded and manifested on verb alone. Is that, is that true? Do you see that? Therefore, verbs are called powerhouse in a sentence. If I have already used this word, this is what I meant. Because it controls everything, it is called the central aspect of a sentence. It is a very powerful thing in a sentence. It controls everything. Okay? Among many other things, that is interplay of functional categories, that is tense, aspect, number, person, gender, agreement, all those things are either manifested, stored or projected in and around verb. Okay? These are parts of universal principle. In every language, you are going to see that. Whether some features are projected or not, may be part of individual languages. That is, Hindi projects more than English does. This may be, may, may be language internal phenomena, but whatever it does, does at the verb is a specific principle of language. Okay? Now, among many things that predicate controls is nature of its objects. I think I had asked you this question last time or maybe not. What is the relationship between verb and its object? I did not. Okay. So, by now we know three things. Now, now let us let us drop predicate for a moment. We have talked enough about this and whatever we are going to talk now also applies to predicate a discussion on predicate. So, let us talk about verb and objects. Have you heard this word object? Yes? No? Yes. Object in connection with sentences. Have you heard about that? Object in connection with sentences. Yes? No? You need to tell me something. Yes. yes. Okay. What is an, what's an object? Like we have spent enough time on subjects and now I think we have a fairly good sense of what subjects do, what subjects are and why subjects are the way they are. A fairly good sense of it. What are objects in a sentence and how do we know whether we need a subject or whether we need a predicate, whether we need an object or not? About subjects, we have a principle that subjects are required, end of the story. So, we do not need to figure out anything, but that is that principle does not apply to objects. See this thing? If I, if I say I was sleeping, this is a good sentence, I was sleeping, right? I can say it in more contexts and make it more relevant. I can say when you called, I was sleeping. Does this sentence have an object? It has a verb, it has a subject, it does not have an object. And like this, there could be plenty of sentences in every language which does not have a does not have an object, which is to say that objects are not a required part of a sentence. Whether of whether you are going to see an object in a sentence or not depends on verb. How do we figure that out? Okay? That is the next question we are going to address. This is what I mean by what, how do we describe nature of verb and uh, what is an object? These are the two questions uh, that will be answered in that and also it will partially answer the question 
about relationship between subject, predicate and an object. We, are, we have already seen the relationship between subject and its predicate, we are, we are going to see the relationship between verb and object. Okay? All right. Uh, so, you have, you have seen these things, right? We have, a, we have lexical categories in sentences which simply means words and their categories could be either nouns, verbs, adjectives, prepositions. I have discussed preposition with you. Right? Now, we understand what a preposition is. Okay. We talked about subjects and, and predicates. We are going to be looking at <coughs> objects. So, when we talk about the nature of a verb, the, the reason why we need to talk about nature of verb is because it determines the number of objects it requires. Only by looking at the nature of verb, you can tell whether this verb needs an object or not. Okay? So, if a, if a sentence like, what was the sentence that I gave you? Yes, I, was I was sleeping. If this sentence does not have an object, then not having an object follows from the nature of the verb sleep. Okay? So, look, so, what we mean by nature of, nature of verb is, have you heard these words? Intransitive, transitive, what do they mean? Intransitive, if I ask you literal meaning of the word intransitive. Transition is different from transitive. Okay, they may sound similar, but different. But nonetheless, nice, nice uh, effort. Let us understand this, this, these terms in its grammatical meaning. Okay? Let us forget about its literal meaning. Let us understand them in terms of their grammatical implications. Whenever we say a verb is transitive, we mean the verb is going to have one object. Okay? Intransitive verbs will have no objects. And then, at the same time, we could mention there is another type of verb which is called ditransitive, which simply means if transitive is, has one object, ditransitives have two objects. Intransitives, we, we do not have a word called uh, zero transitive or something. Intransitive means no object should be straightforward, no issues. Still, this does not help us enough, right? This describes the nature of the verb that is transitive, intransitive or ditransitive. That is 0, intransitive 0, transitive 1, ditransitive 2. But then how do I know which verb is intransitive and which verb is transitive? I will decide the number of objects if I know a verb is intransitive or transitive or ditransitive. But then how do I know? Either? One can say, okay, let me first say the question, how do I know a verb is transitive or intransitive? One answer could be, if the verb has two objects, then it is ditransitive. If it has one object, then it is transitive and if it has no objects, then it is intransitive. But that does not help us either. We are, we are talking about so, this, this helps us if you have a sentence. If we do not have a sentence, then how does this help? See the, see the problem? We know the description, but this does not still help much. So, if I give you a sentence, I was sleeping, then you know there is no object and this much of information could be helpful and you can see, what is the verb here? sleep. This is, so, the word sleep is an intransitive verb. But that we can derive, deduct from a sentence. If I just give you a verb and ask you to tell me whether it is a transitive or intransitive, how would you know? There is no way to find out. But, I mean, that is not apparent. What we mean is, that is not apparent. We need to know just a little thing. 
Keep in mind, it is different from gender. What did I tell you about gender? Gender of a word is arbitrarily assigned. A chair is feminine, there is no intrinsic, no intrinsic rule which tells us chair must be feminine. Okay? That is arbitrarily assigned, but this is not arbitrary, there is a pattern in it. The pattern is very simple. Let us look at these sentences. So, the first set of verbs that you see, they are examples of intransitive verbs. Okay? They are in examples of intransitive verbs, sleep, go, come, sit, dance. These are just couple of examples, few examples. Languages are full of such examples. If you come up with a sentence with these verbs, you do not have a, you do not have an object. Can you see? Can you read these sentences? John was sleeping, no object. Go, Bill was going home. You see a noun after the verb go, right? which is home, but it is not an object of this verb, which even complicates the, pro the problem. This is why I have highlighted these words in red. They are not objects, but the first sentence is at least simpler that there is no object. In the second one, you have something and still we are saying that is not an object. The, the level of complexity is just higher. How do I know? Right? Third one, Mary was coming from school. We have a noun, school, we have something more than a noun, uh, we have a preposition and a noun, we will talk about those phrases in a moment, not, not in a moment, some other time. But the verb come is an intransitive verb, the, what follows the verb coming is not an object of the verb. Okay? Chris was sitting in a chair. The verb sit is an intransitive verb in a chair, just like from a school is not an object. Nancy was dancing. You do not see any object there. That is a clear intransitive verb. Get it? In the second set, verbs like eat, read and write, these are examples of transitive verbs. You can read them. You see the, they are objects in blue they require, they are the required part of a sentence. If you just say, if I just say, Bob was eating, the idea is, this sentence is not complete as long as the object is not present. Okay? Chris was reading a novel. We must not say Chris was reading. We have to say, Chris was reading a novel or whatever the person was reading. The, that part is the object of the verb. And then Lisa was writing a letter. See this thing? These are the objects of the verb, in, the objects of transitive verb. And the last two examples are examples of ditransitive verbs where you have two objects. Again, a sentence is not complete without both the objects. So, we, we can say Tony gave a pen to his daughter. <coughs> pen is also an object, to his daughter is also another, is another object. Both the objects must be present in the sentence for the sentence to be complete. Nancy was teaching Japanese English. What does this mean? What does this sentence mean? She was teaching English to Japanese people. Right? Look at this. We can say the same sentence in two different ways. We can say Nancy was teaching Japanese English. We can say Nancy was teaching English to Japanese. See this thing? But both must be there. Therefore, the verbs like teach and give are called ditransitive verbs. Now, these are just examples of what I have told you. I have still not told you, how do I know whether a verb requires an object or not? 
you can say because we are not native speakers of english you need to check this thing only with the native speaker because we are not native speakers of english a sentence like bob was eating to us it sounds all right right this is why we don't depend on the judgment about a sentence who is not a native speaker okay we can say chris was reading it's fine lisa was writing that's also fine <coughs> now i am not trying to say our english is bad i am also not trying to say we don't understand how language works the reason why in our english these sentences are good without their objects is because of this reason again in languages we not only drop subjects but we can also drop objects in our languages we can drop objects in the context okay so if we have a verb khana which is a transitive verb then we can drop objects right because the objects are retrievable from the context hindi tamil telugu malayalam marathi gujarati allows dropping of objects also if a sentence without object in english is good to us that is the influence of our native languages on english where english does not allow dropping of objects so if you are asking a speaker of english from india these sentences are good to them if you ask these sentences to a native speaker of english they won't be able to tell you i mean i'm sorry they will be able to tell you that this sentence is incomplete when you say bob was eating the sentence is incomplete they will they will still be waiting for the object bob was eating what do you mean okay and the sentence sounds incomplete because of the lack of object all right now to wind it up and we will we'll discuss this thing uh, very briefly uh, when we meet next time with with the other topics we only need to ask a question we we only need to question the verb with what if you if you can question the verb with what and you have a legitimate question then you will get an answer too if the question is not legitimate then there is no question of getting an answer as long as you can question the verb keep in mind only with what question the verb with what then that's a transitive verb i can question eat with what or not eat you just you, you don't have, you don't even need to get a complete sentence what did you eat you can simply say eat what right that's a does this sound like a good question if it's a good question then you will get an answer to eat pizza eat ice cream then we know that this verb is transitive and it will need an object okay read what Is that a good question write what if you look at intransitive verbs can we question what the verb sleep with the same question sleep what and this is why i am telling you please don't use other questions where when how none of them just what sleep what go what sit what dance what okay if if the question is not legitimate the, there is no possibility of getting an answer and therefore the verb is an intransitive verb which in turn means no object okay the the question about ditransitive verb is you still need the, the same question what but there is no way to figure out whether the verb is ditransitive as long as you can figure out it's a transitive verb that's good enough okay ditransitive verbs to non natives we have to find out specifically keep this in mind 
I have given you a diagnostic test. This test is not part of either principle or parameter. This is a diagnostic test and is not 100 percent foolproof. It works only to a great extent in let us say we can say 99 percent of the cases. Still 1 percent of the case does not work with this diagnostic test and this is not the right time to show you that 1 percent. At one point I will show you where it this does not work and you will be able to see. Again you know those verbs where this rule does not work. It is not there is nothing new that I am telling you. You already know that is our mind knows what is a transitive verb, what is an intransitive verb, which sentence is going to need an object, which sentence is not going to need an object. Our mind also knows what I am going to tell you now is a verb is transitive or intransitive. So, this transitive or intransitive nature of a verb does not change or does not vary from language to language. If go is intransitive in English, it is going to stay intransitive in all the languages of the world. That does not change, that does not vary from language to language and this we that is human mind knows very well. We stop here, I think you will have classes. Any quick question? Uh, see ditransitive verbs are, are an extension of transitive verbs. So, as long as you can figure out the teach is also a transitive, like you can question teach what, right? As long as you can figure out it is a transitive, that is good enough. Whether it is ditransitive or not, this diagnostic does not work there. There is no diagnostics for that, only that, that's, that has, you have to depend on native intuition for that native intuition for that. Okay? But you can definitely say this is also a transitive. Okay? But the 1 percent cases where I said it does not work, some of the verbs that look like transitive are not transitive really. Okay? You can still question them with what, but they are not transitive. Therefore, I said in 1 percent of the cases they do not work. With that 1 percent, I did not mean ditransitive verbs. Okay? More later. Thank you.